the house of horrors. It was a scary place. Troubled youth sentenced, confined, then terrorized. Barbaric treatment and inappropriate forms of discipline. Serve a life sentence of pain. I stopped being a person. I stopped feeling. Peter Ackman uncovers stories of widespread systemic abuse. How many kids are we talking about? Between 10 and 20,000. Training schools that house children and predators. He loved beating the kids up. He enjoyed it. And the victims who stayed silent through their endless nightmare. I had a life of torment. Now speak out. This needs to get out to the world, what happened to us. And a terrifying diagnosis. They walked in and said, it's cancer. A deadly childhood disease with little chance of a cure. It wasn't good. Brings debilitating treatments and heart-wrenching setbacks. She had relapsed again. But now, a glimmer of hope. No one actually thought this would ever work. Dr. Marla Shapiro explores an innovative new cancer treatment. Was it surprising? It was almost without precedent. That turns the patient's own blood into a weapon that may stop the disease in its tracks. I've been at this for a while. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, and thanks for joining us. It went on for years at schools created to handle difficult kids. Training schools, they were called in Ontario, intended to reform bad behavior. But it's the behavior of some of the staff that we're investigating. Allegations of emotional, physical, even sexual abuse. And we're not talking about dozens of victims, not even hundreds. As WFI's Peter Ackman reveals, there may well be thousands of children who suffered terrible abuse. Driving in silence for hours, Phil Minot is lost in thought, nervous for what's down the highway. He's traveling to Coburg, Ontario, back to the boarding school he was forced to attend as a young boy. My main concern is, you know, what, what's going to be triggered? A place where he says he lived in fear every day. Yep. That is what I remember right there. Brookside Training School, that's what it was called in 1967. Phil was just 13 years old. He hasn't been back in 52 years. What went through your mind? It, it, it was like, like a horror movie coming back to haunt you all over again. Phil ended up at Brookside as punishment. He grew up poor near Thunder Bay, Ontario. He says his stepmother would regularly beat him. He rebelled by stealing candy from local stores and that landed him in front of a judge. So I basically told him how my life was at home. And uh, I said, I, I really got the brunt end of the stick. And he says, well, I said, I'm going to send you someplace to protect you. Protect you? Protect me. That's his word. That was his words. Brookside was one of 18 so-called training schools in Ontario, peppered across the province, most in small towns. Funded by the provincial government from 1931 to 1984, They'd housed tens of thousands of children, many as young as eight years old, sent there because they were unmanageable for everything from running away from home to more serious, violent crimes. Publicly, officials from the schools touted a curriculum which included academics, phys ed and trades, like woodworking and metal shop. These photographs were printed in local newspapers and appeared in government reports showing well-treated, happy children and making the promise bad kids would be transformed into productive and lawful members of society. It was like a holiday the first month. And then after that, you know, the, the, the horror story started. Phil says he was physically abused, including one day when he was nearly drowned. But things would get even worse. He says a staff member started paying special attention to him on the pretense of helping him with a snoring problem. He said, well, maybe you need a little massage or a little, little help sleeping. So, you know, my back got massaged and maybe about a month in, a little bit longer. Uh, he got me out of bed one day and he said, you're going to start again and started off with the, with the uh, massage. And, and I was, I don't know, 60 pounds soaking wet. I was a small guy. And he picked me up and put me on the, 
stood me on the desk and uh, he started fondling me and, and, uh, he, and he started sucking on my penis. And, you know, I, I was naive. I, I didn't have a clue what was going on. You're scared. I, I, I'm scared, yeah. I'm not sure that what happened once, twice. Then uh, I had to uh, return the favor. Phil says he was repeatedly forced to perform sexual acts with the adult staff member for the next 10 months. Nasty secrets Phil would bury deep inside for 50 years. He told no one until he contacted a lawyer who suggested he write out exactly what happened to him. Two days in front of my computer, uh, bought out my story, and uh, it's okay. Take your yeah. time. I couldn't tell my wife, so I gave her the paper, and I went for a walk. That, that hurt. Were you embarrassed to tell her? Very. Phil Minot eventually came forward and sued the province over the sexual and physical abuse. But his claim and hundreds of other individual lawsuits were quietly settled out of court. The government had also paid off and apologized to more than 700 students from three other schools. But lawyer John Patak says this is just a drop in the bucket. He's leading a $600 million class action lawsuit against the Ontario government for the remaining survivors. We've heard uh, all manner of abuse, uh, from widespread physical and sexual uh, abuse, to solitary confinement, to barbaric treatment and inappropriate forms of discipline. One of the primary goals of this class action is to shine a light on what we consider to be a dark chapter in Ontario's history. How many kids are we talking about? We think it's between 10 and 20,000. One of our class members have told us is an abject failure at the highest level to monitor, control, and supervise the most vulnerable people in our society. Rick Brown was also sent to Brookside. Like Phil Minot, he says he was physically abused. While they were there three years apart... Glad to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yes. On this day, they met back at the school to support each other. Rick was sent to Brookside in 1963. He was just 10 years old. This is, this is eerie. It, this is, yeah, scary. God, this brings back memories, I'll tell you. There's your main office right there. Yeah. See the, see the fire escape? Yeah. That's the same as it was in 1963. Oh. Feel like the 10-year-old kid, you know? I, I, I see me looking out of some of these windows. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I, I'm not cold, I'm just vibrating. <sighs> that used to be a bad corner in there. I got trapped in there. He uh, grabbed my testicles, I remember that. Not to talk, not to say nothing. <sighs> I remember one time, I think we were thinking about if we'd get out that window and jump down and run. I remember that, off, 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 off these roofs. I, I thought about it, but I was too afraid to run because oh, they caught small. the kids, yeah, they, oh, caught, they caught them. And when they caught you, you, you wished you never did it. Yes. Like Phil, Rick says he also came from an abusive home in Guelph, Ontario. And like many forced into these training schools, a minor infraction landed Rick in front of a judge and an indefinite sentence. You were 10 years old. What was that like? It was awful. <laughs> it was terrible. It was like a prison? Yeah, very much. Felt like it. Yeah, a prison for kids, yeah. Right away, Rick says he was targeted by one particularly vicious staff member. Yeah, when I look back, he was, he was a bit of a sadist, I think. He loved beating the kids up. He enjoyed it. For Rick, it was a nightmare. He says the worst beating happened one night in the school gym. And he walked towards me, and I can still see that. The glasses and the dark hair and the scowl on his face. It was a, a blur of being pummeled. 
I don't know if he punched me. I know he slapped me on the ears and he popped my eardrums when he did that with the palms of his hands. And you went down. Yeah, yeah, it was excruciatingly painful. Yeah. In my head when he did that, and I called him a son of a bitch, and I told him, someday I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna come back and kill you. And that was the last thing I said after he kicked me in the midsection and uh, knocked me unconscious. The beatings at Brookside deeply affected Rick for decades. I was a loving kid. I was a, a kid that had a big heart and my life stopped there. My emotional growth stopped the day I went into Coburg. You stopped being a kid. I stopped being a person. I stopped feeling. And, and I have three children. My children suffered from that. I couldn't be a, a good dad. And now I'm, I'm... Turning it around. Yeah. Rick credits being alive today to his wife, Linda. And he says she gave him the courage to join the class action lawsuit. It's really important because this needs to be heard. This needs to get out to the, to the world, what happened to us, because it's been a dirty little secret for way too long. Years of living in fear. I mean, this is systematic abuse. Yes. Shames victims into silence. I never told anybody for 22 years. When W5 continues. Rick Brown and Phil Minot last set foot on the Brookside School grounds in Coburg, Ontario in the 1960s. Today, just the sight of it brings them back to their nightmares. The, sh the shock, just scary. Uh, it, yeah. Very scary, yeah. Stories of abuse from Ontario training schools have slowly come to light. Rick and Phil are not alone. They're two victims amongst perhaps thousands going back decades. This investigation into alleged sexual abuse. But allegations of sexual and physical abuse of students from only three of 18 schools were made public in the early 90s. Karen Edwards was one of the first. When you spoke out, so many other people came and felt strong enough to speak out themselves. Right, right. It's pretty heroic. <laughs> well, I don't feel that way. Karen was just 15 when she was sent to the Grandview Training School for Girls in Cambridge, Ontario. She says over the next three years, she was repeatedly abused. A stark contrast to what she thought would happen when the judge sent her there. I thought it was a place where I was going to learn etiquette. Because you heard training school. Because I heard training school. When we drove up, onto the grounds of the training school. I've seen the bars on the windows and realized this is no school for girls for etiquette. At its peak, Grandview housed 120 girls. These pictures from inside show much of it was more like a prison than a boarding school. Our rooms were existed of a bed, a toilet, a sink, the doors locked every night when we went to bed, and uh, the lights never turned off. Never? Never. Could you sleep? Well, after all the screaming of the girls and all the horrific noises through the night, it wasn't easy. Karen quickly learned about the horrors firsthand, especially at night when she was alone and vulnerable to the male guards on duty. Can you tell me about that, that night? I was in my room, and the doors were locked. I heard the door unlock, and take your time. My perpetrators came in. The two guards. The two guards. Yeah. And 
One straddled me and put their hand over my mouth. And the other one sodomized me. Karen says the guards threatened to do it again, or even worse, if she reported them. So I kept my mouth shut. I never told my mother. I never told my grandparents. I never told anybody for 22 years. And she wasn't the only one claiming to be sexually assaulted. In 1994, a former guard was brought to justice. 65-year-old Robert Vernon Finley, Finley was a and convicted of numerous counts of sexual assault against girls at Grandview. But for Karen, her abuse was something she didn't talk about for years. What did it do to you to keep that inside? It messed me up. I had children. I lost my children. I couldn't take care of them. I turned to drugs. I had a life of torment. But while the children were threatened into silence, most of the adults working at the training schools, like Pine Ridge in Bowmanville, Ontario, which is now abandoned, also said nothing. Don White's was the exception. In the late 1960s, he worked as a psychologist at that school. Pine Ridge was one of the province's largest centers, housing hundreds of children at any one time. It was a job Don would come to dread after witnessing children being abused firsthand. They were there to be punished. There was no legitimate treatment or rehabilitation. You say, you say it's abuse. It is abuse. It's child abuse sanctions promoted by the government of Ontario. They don't think we use the word torture at that time, but it is sure as hell it was when I look back. Most disturbing of all was the constant and lengthy use of solitary confinement for children as young as eight years old, a common punishment used at most training schools. This was a punishment for minor things like chewing gum in church, acting like uh, what the superintendent or assistant superintendent thought was not proper behavior. The kids called the solitary confinement cell the digger, because the only way to escape was to dig your way out. How did they manage? They didn't manage well. There was no excuse for mistreating kids like that except for some sadistic and vengeful people hired as staff. And there were some sadistic staff there, I can tell you. After a few months, Don had seen enough. He wrote a letter to the school superintendent demanding that the abuse stop. I said, this, this is not treatment. This is not education. And this is not training it at all. And you were ignored? Yes. And then what did you do? After about a year and a half, I just said, I have to leave and I have to go pu public. In 1976, Whites wrote an article in Toronto Life magazine chronicling some of the physical and mental abuse at training schools, public revelations that triggered a spirited but short-lived debate at Ontario's legislature. Still, the government kept the schools funded and open for another eight years. To this day, most of the abuse victims have yet to be acknowledged. But in the early 90s, Karen Edwards and the other survivors from Grandview School did receive some compensation and an apology. It is a source of shame for all of us. What did that mean to you? The apology was welcomed. We were all in the, the seats up in... Queen's Park. Queen's Park. We were pretty noisy. Along with Grandview, survivors from only two other Ontario training schools have ever received any kind of official restitution from the government. One of them was at St. Joseph's in Alfred, Ontario. That's where David Sweet was sent when he was just 12. Today, he's a federal member of parliament and believes more should be done for training school survivors. David says he and his brother were both physically abused at St. Joseph's, but it wasn't until years later his brother told him he had also been raped. I, I, you know, brushed it off for years, but then I started to hear more of the stories, and I regret that I, I uh, didn't believe him. 
that's still with you. Yeah, yeah. David wants every child abused at all 18 Ontario training schools to be acknowledged and those who haven't been compensated to finally get what they deserve. He feels only then will true healing begin. There's thousands and maybe tens of thousands of people who are still walking around with uh, a lot worse consequences than me, with no closure, no restitution, no, po no apology. Today, David is using his political capital and contacts to push for a provincial inquiry. I mean, this is systematic state-run abuse. Yes, the present provincial government, of course, they're not responsible for what happened then, but they're responsible to make it right. For five weeks, W5 requested an interview with Ontario's Attorney General, Carolyn Mulrooney. She's the one who can call for an inquiry and offer compensation to the victims. But she refused W5's request, so we caught up with her after question period. Thank Ms. Mulrooney, uh, Peter Ackman, CTV W5. Uh, for decades, children were taken away from their families by the Ontario government, placed in training schools where it's been documented that there's been systematic sexual and physical abuse. Uh, when is this government going to apologize broadly to those children for what happened to them and maybe some compensation? Well, our government uh, would violently uh, denounce any kind of violence against children. Do you think a public inquiry is necessary to look into these so-called training schools? Well, I think looking into uh, issues, things that have happened in the past is very important, but this time uh, we've got to make sure that uh, we are protecting our children. And, uh, but do these children the not need an apology of some sort from the Ontario government? It wasn't your government who did it, but the Ontario government as a whole? Uh, other children who have been placed into schools? Well, absolutely. It's unacceptable. Um, and, you know, this is something that uh, we've got to look at very closely and make sure that we're protecting our children. Will you commit Thank to looking you. into Thank an inquiry? While politicians delay that acknowledgement, Many survivors, like Rick Brown and Phil Minot, are still mired in the trauma that they've lived through. What do you think those months of abuse did to you in your life? Oh, it, it changed my life. It, it, it did. What I went through, I wouldn't want anybody else to go through. Well, the class action lawsuit against the Ontario government was certified by a court in December. But there's no date yet on when it's likely to be heard.